Welcome to the show, Eddie Armani. You are a former PA and confidant of the late great icon Tina Turner. Having met her as a child, you ended up becoming her personal assistant and a close friend of some 20 years. You also persuaded uh, Ike and Tina Turner to allow you to set up their first official fan club. There's tons to talk about with you about that and loads of other stuff for you. Uh, Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. Please do tell us more. Oh. Gosh, where do I start? Go for it. I was just um, an over-excited fan at a very young age. And the minute that I saw Tina, heard her voice, um, it was on American Bandstand, which was a black and white television show that came on weekly in America. And um, when I heard that voice, I was hooked. I sang in the choir, I went to church, I prayed a lot. That was in my family uh, routine. And every night when I finished my prayers, I said, oh God, please let me meet Ike and Tina Turner. And that was for quite a few years. Mm. And we were living in Seattle, Washington. That's where I was born. Mm. And I went to summer camp and I came home from summer camp and my mother, well, my grandmother broke the news to me that we were moving to Los Angeles. And, um, I didn't want to go because I was very close to my grand, my grandmother, extremely close. And mm. I said, no, 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 I won't go. And um, then my grandmother whispered something to my mother. My mother whispered something to my grandmother. And the hook was, they said, well, do you know the Tina Turner? I can Tina Turner. They live in Los Angeles. <laughs> and at that point, it was like, when do we start packing? And so we <laughs> moved to Los Angeles. And um, the truth was, I had just started junior high school. I was obsessed with music from a very, very young age. And if I remember correctly, the thing that used to be really exciting is that I would go home uh, after school and um, on my way home, I'd pass by the record shop and the record shops used to always put speakers outside their record shop. And they used to play the latest records and all that. And sometimes if I um, wasn't going to be too late or whatever, I would dash into the record shop and listen to a couple of records. And I would always go in and ask every week, was there a new I can Tina Turner record? I drove them absolutely mad. And from that point is when I thought, I'd, oh, let me just pick up the phone and call I can Tina. So I just called information and asked for their phone number. And they said, I'm sorry, we have no listing. And I said, um, oh, no, you must have a listing. You must have a listing because it's I can Tina Turner. And back in those days, I read an album. Album covers were like um, God, the Bible to me. And I would read all the inter notes, um, the inside of the album, who the musicians were, who the background singers were, where mm. the photographer shot the pictures. I mean, I was obsessed. And then at the very bottom, I, I saw it said um, recorded at Bollock Sound Recording Studio. And I thought, well, I'll give it a, a, a shot. And by this time, I was so discouraged because I couldn't get Ike and Tina's phone number. And I thought it was just going to be like, you know, I'm in Hollywood. I thought it was going to be like Hollywood. Pick up the phone, call Ike and Tina. It wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I called up and asked for the phone number to Bollock Sound Recording Studio. And as she gave me the number, I, I, I literally froze and thought, oh, my gosh. So I went on to um, call this number. And every time I called the number, as soon as someone answered, I would hang up. And it took me mm -hmm. about three days to get the courage up. And I spoke to this lovely, lovely woman who was Canadian. Um, it was very, very terribly kind to me. And so I explained my situation to her and she explained her situation, which is that I continue were on the road. Um, and I just said I was their biggest fan. Can I please meet them and whatever? So this must have gone on this conversation, me calling this woman almost every day after school just to get more information from her, driving her mad. But she, I think because of my enthusiasm and my voice and the excitement, she, it, 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 she just took a kindness to me. And, um, yeah. and then after I think about, uh, gosh, a year and a half, almost, yeah, about a year and a half, uh, they were having the official grand opening of this recording studio. And um, she said, I have a surprise for you. And I said, oh, what? I mean, I couldn't imagine what it was. And she said, I can Tina are going to have a grand opening of the recording studio. And I've gotten permission since you're I can Tina's biggest fan and you called every day after school and you're so dedicated. We're going to invite you down to the opening. Mm. And from that day onwards, it was that was it. Well, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Do you write social conscious music? I just write what I feel. I, I don't it doesn't I don't know. Um, I actually once wrote a song and it was so close to the bone that 
it kind of frightened me. I, it's like writing po poetry. I think it was talking about myself in a different kind of way. And um, funny enough, I went on years later to record this song and um, the, 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 the producer kept asking me, oh my God, I mean, how can you, where did you come up with these ideas and this and that? And for some reason, it always, I don't know why, it still to this day doesn't make sense to me. I think the only thing is that I can come up with is that I was writing about things that I experienced in another lifetime or things that um, were just, were out there. And it wasn't I a love just, song, nothing like that, right? Well, actually, funny enough, it was a love song, but it was, um, it wasn't your typical, I love you, baby, come back home, I miss you. Yeah. I think Tina did some uh, conscious songs back in the day. Well, they did actually. Oh my gosh, funny you mentioned that because there was a song on their album which had Proud Mary on it, which was, of course, one of their biggest albums called Working Together. Yeah, and well, that that's album, time. that song was a message song, was yeah. a, you know, a, a, yes, Social yes, content. yes. Social. You're absolutely right. And I remember reading an a, a article years later, or whatever, and, and something after Tina had her solo success. And she said within the Ike and Tina catalog, that was one of her favorite songs. A lot of those people back in the days, even though they was doing a lot of love songs, there was there was a lot going on. You had the war, you know, and all, all kind of things happening. But the music reflected everything, and and especially the social conscious music because it helped stop the Vietnam War. I saw that myself. There was so many great songs, even the songs like "Come Together" by the Beatles and um, uh, "Sly and the Family Stones." Yeah, I love that song. And he said, "We are everyday people." I mean, to to to, to bring everyone together um, mm -hmm. to talk about just because your hair is long or short, black or white, purple or green. You know, there was so many songs about look at what we're doing to each other. Look well, at the world about, that we we have created. About, Marvin Gaye. Uh, what, what was Marvin Gaye's? Marvin um, Gaye, what's going on? What's going on? I mean, you couldn't have a better written song uh, about, and 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 even to uh, today, I I list, was listening because I I listen to my music every single day, and I was listening to Marvin, and I just thought, this look, listen to all this stuff this man was talking about. Stevie no, no, Wonder was another a one. He's a prophet, man. That dude, prophets, he, correct? They he's were a prophet. The stuff that he's talking about. He was talking about back then is going on right now. Yes. And yes. That song where he yes. says fish, fish full of mercury. He was talking about the environment right there, right? Absolutely. And the Absolutely. lyrics, right? And, and, and I love it because he goes, uh, when he told Barry Gordy, Barry said, what, what, man, you you killing these women out here. They're going crazy and stuff like that. You know, and he, go, he, he goes, yeah, but I got to tell people what's going on about this war. That's where the title came from. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And it, Absolutely. It, and it, actually, on that subject of you saying that, and um, there was a great documentary that I, I, I saw with Smokey Robinson and, and, and Barry. And Barry was actually being quite honest. He was saying, because Motown was so successful, and they had kicked down doors and opened doors and did all this stuff. And he wanted to keep that formula going. But as Stevie Wonder and Marvin and different artists started, um, uh, Norman Whitfield, who wrote all those great yes. songs with the Temptations yeah. and all that, um, he he um, w w didn't want to give the the go ahead for them, for them to create these type of songs. And once he did, even Barry went, okay, Hands up, I was wrong because people want to know what's going on in the world. Yeah, see, see, a lot of those executive people, they don't have a clue. You know, he I mean, he, he thought, no, no, Marvin, that's the wrong thing to do. And then, then it turned out to be the right thing. Same yes. same thing would happen with same thing happened with Prince and Warner Brothers, right? Uh they said, What are you gonna do now, Prince? He said, You know what? I'm gonna do a rock record. They said, no, man, heck no, you got these women going crazy out here. You're going to stop and do a rock record, right? Yeah. So that that's, you remember, you remember when he did Controversy and the, the tunes like that? Uh, you know you know what? That little mother, I call him a mother, he yeah. hit the scene. And I remember being in my early, I was in my, oh gosh, early teens, I think just starting high school. I loved, I loved I Feel For You and all that, don't but when he came out with controversy and the, I, the album cover just alone 
was controversy. Well, I mean, it, it, it was about having a record company tell you that you can't create whatever you want to. Yeah. See, that's what that yes. that's what that thing was about. And he said, "What are you talking about? I want to play. I'm a musician. I, I feel rock. I want to play rock song. Here, here's where where the, the, the same similarities go. When he got out of his contract, what's the first record he did? Purple Rain. So Warner Brothers missed out on a whole lot of money because they said, "Don't do that." Mm -hmm. They made a movie out of Purple. He made a movie out of Purple Rain. He, uh, you can't absolutely. Stop, you can't absolutely. stop creating. Creative people from where you can call it whatever you want to, as long as people love it. I read that um, you were a regular dancer on Soul Train. Can you tell us a little bit oh, about wow. that for us? What, Absolutely. When was that? How did that come about? Well, I tell you, Soul Train was the, the thing that was kind of like going around um, underground, you know, I mean, around school and all that stuff. And the good story about Soul Train for me was that um, they used to do like Studio 54. You stand in a line, they would handpick you and you would be okay. one of the dancers. Yeah. And I was never picked. And at this point, I got there was a few of us and we got really pissed off. So mm -hmm. we got really clever and thought, oh, we're going to get in there, get in there, get in there. And so we found a way. We went around to the back and they had this this fence. <laughs> this And we used to climb and scale the wall. I scaled the uh, so train fence to get into so train for about a year and a half nice. until i finally got in and the funny thing about it yeah. the woman who used to pick people used to remember i used to thought she i didn't pick them and yeah. what we would do we would we would always keep an eye there was about four or five of us and we would say she's coming she's coming and then we would go mingle into the crowd or go yeah. to the bathroom get <laughs> lost but i was really good friends and danced with jeffrey daniels and Oh, Jody wow. Watley yeah. and Jermaine Stewart was a really, really good friend of mine that when I actually moved to London, mm. uh, Jermaine was one of the people that um, introduced me to a lot of people in the scene and all that stuff. Yeah. But those days of Soul Train was like, I mean, and when I went on Soul Train and of course, uh, she was coming after me one day to kick me off. And I continued with the special guest and I was so excited. And I ran up to the stage really quick and I started talking to me. Then, then the next thing that I continued came out to do a sound check and um i just kind of looked at her and gave her a dirty look and just kind of like kept talking because i was just, you know i was in she couldn't I'll get me out now thank, thank you god bless Great nice to meet you. You. okay i'll talk to you Thank you so much for watching. To stay up to date, please click subscribe and hit the bell. You can also join our group on Facebook and find us on LinkedIn and Instagram.